Thank you and good morning. Glad to be with all of you. Appreciate your interest in helping to grow our community and, and our businesses that make our community so vibrant. I'm here to tell the story of FC Cincinnati and um, uh, really um, just a tremendous story. Uh, certainly that far surpassed our expectations uh, when we launched, but I would share with you we were pretty confident that, uh, that it was going to be wildly successful. Um, I think to start, the story begins with, uh, for, for me at least, just w observation. I, I've always uh, tried to be someone who observed not just in my space but in other spaces uh, with an eye towards opportunities and an eye towards always looking to make our community a better place. Uh, I think one of the greatest things about Cincinnati is we have a, 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 big, a, a big league uh, dynamic in terms of the arts and culture and our companies. We far out hit our, um, our pay range, if you will, um, with all the companies in town. But if you want to be a leader in this city, no one tells you to uh, stand in line. No one says, wait your turn. Uh, if you have uh, good ideas in this community, this is a community with senior leadership on the political side or in the business side, civic side, that embraces opportunities to partner with people who come forward with good ideas. So my story is I was at the Bengals for uh, almost 20 years. While I was at the Bengals, uh, had the opportunity to be elected three times to Cincinnati City Council, uh, which is supposed to be a part-time job. Um, my pop, my uh, background in politics, when I, uh, before I got to the Bengals, I was uh, hired to manage the campaign to uh, get the sales tax approved to create the Reds and Bengals stadiums and also ultimately the banks. And when I ran for city council, it was to finish the job and get the banks done. Uh, so uh, when I left city council, because I didn't need that headache anymore, um, I still wanted to be civically involved. And so I was asked to be on the board of my kid's soccer club, um, at the time, Hammer, and then started researching a lot about the US soccer community. My son was on a pretty good team. We were traveling all over the United States uh, for events. So you're seeing these million dollar facilities being built. You're seeing thousands of parents with their kids going to all these different places all over the US for tournaments and college coaches and whatnot. And so certainly it seemed that there was a phenomenon. So when I joined the board, I pushed for a merger of our club with another club and end up being the president of the board. And so with that background, sort of the Bengals and um, city council civically, and, uh, and then sort of this introduction, to the soccer business, I, I saw an opportunity where soccer was this growing phenomenon, and I'm going to walk you through the presentation. But my, my thought was there would be a time when soccer would be a really big deal. Uh, Mike Brown told me when they founded the Bengals in 1968, no one knew, the, they didn't know the NFL was going to be the global phenomenon it is, you know, the 800-pound the gorilla in sports culture in our country. They didn't know, uh, but it became that. And so my thought was there could be a time when soccer becomes a pretty big gorilla, maybe not 800 pounds, but pretty big. And, and I wanted to make sure Cincinnati had the opportunity to have that as one more asset in our community, which led me to start to explore the ability to launch FC. So the, the premise started with a belief that, F, that uh, Cincinnati is a major league sports town. Uh, I say respectfully, it is what sets us apart from other very fine cities, Dayton, Toledo, Lexington, Louisville in our region. Uh, those major league sports teams, the Reds and the Bengals, they help put us on the map. Uh, every night on ESPN, on CBS Sports and whatnot, uh, you know, it puts us in, a, in the national conversation as a big league city. Uh, in many cases, on par with cities that are much bigger. Uh, and so uh, we have the first professional baseball team. We have a NFL team that was founded by a coach who was already in the Hall of Fame before he came to Cincinnati and was considered one of the modern inventors of today's NFL. So we've established that we're a major league city. The question was, could we also be a major league soccer city and have uh, soccer be one more jewel in our crown? And a big special Cincinnati welcome to our new friends from the United Soccer League. The recent All-Star Game hosted here in Cincinnati reinforced what we already knew, that we are a big league sports town. It's exciting to stand here today to add yet another team to our city's roster. Please welcome Jeff Birding, the new president and general manager. One of the biggest youth soccer communities in the entire United States 
you now have a pro team. Because I believe it would be smart to believe in soccer and to believe in Cincinnati, FC Cincinnati, starting today. You know, what kind of players do we want to wear the jersey, to wear the crest on their heart? Humble, hungry, um, soccer intelligent, good characteristics on and off the field. All the bets right here today. So I'm very, very excited. Starting something from the ground up. Um, and then just the support for the club. Uh, everybody seems to be doing things the right way. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're spending money revamping the stadium. It is a crisp April evening as the lads take the pitch for the first time a professional soccer match we played here on the campus of the University of Cincinnati. Over to Akoli, looking to scissor kick it, and there it is! The first ever goal at Nippert Stadium as oh, the fans, uh, the supporters, uh, the families that are here, I mean, it, I think it's, it, it clearly shows that Cincinnati is easily ready you know, for, for this market for soccer. I mean, it's, it's such a huge positive, you know, the, the numbers that turned out tonight, and uh, they, they make a big difference. So I hope we're able to sustain it and to keep it going. But what, what a fantastic night. Breaking record like that is incredible. And to do it it's so early as a brand new club, I don't even know how to respond to it. It's such a, a great situation. So that was the launch uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, and then I'll walk you through here sort of some of the research that uh, got us to that point. So in terms of uh, soccer here in the United States, uh, in the sort of millennial uh, demographic, 18 to 35, soccer is either a favorite sport or a second favorite sport. Um, you see uh, MLS averaging 22,000 fans in 2015. That's up this year. Uh, you see uh, the MLS uh, building new stadiums, again, successful business people building $150, $250 million stadiums. Certainly they must see a return on the investment. Uh, international games, 100,000, 90,000 at the Rose Bowl. Uh, you can see the uh, expansion teams, Orlando City, which was in our league in 2010. They started playing in 2011, won the league, led the league in attendance. 12, another good season. 13, won the league, led the league in attendance. By the end of 13, they're invited into MLS. 14's a transition year. 15, they're in MLS, averaging over 30,000 fans a game. So you could see a pathway. You could see the growth. Obviously, there's uh, the opportunity with soccer that many, many women played soccer. Uh, that's an advantage over the NFL. That's an advantage over MLB. It's a sport that a lot of women have passion for, and we see that in stadiums, and you see that in some of the demographics. Uh, we're certainly a more international country, uh, and that also fuels interest in soccer. And so with that, we believed, as Don Garber said, sport for a new country. Our country is changing demographically, ethnically, and it would be a good idea to bet on soccer. In our city, over 56,000 youth soccer players, one of the top per capita in the United States, growing international presence, a real priority of the mayor to grow the international presence here in Cincinnati. Uh, and um, you can see worldwide, there's more, there's more people playing soccer on this planet than every other sport combined. It is certainly the world's sports. The ratings for soccer, again, most watched sporting events worldwide. So while the Super Bowl may be the most watched event in the United States, the World Cup in soccer would be the most watched worldwide. Every year at the NFL, I talked about observation. Every year at the NFL, they would send the senior executives of all 32 teams a, a sponsored deck that we would share with local broadcast partners and local sponsors. And it shows that the NFL is king. Because in our country right now, the NFL still is king. But when you peeled it back a little bit, you saw I found something pretty interesting. So this is the exact slide I brought with me from the Bengals that shows um, Americans 12 and older in the ESPN sports poll, the Chilton poll, what is your favorite sport, okay? 12 and older, what's your favorite sport? So you have NFL number one, MLB number two, college football, pro soccer there at number four, 8%, okay? Then above the NBA, college basketball, NHL, and NASCAR. The interesting thing about this slide, I went back 10 years, soccer wasn't on this slide. 10 years ago, women's figure skating was on the slide. Soccer was not on the slide. Okay, so 10 years ago, it comes in at the bottom, and then the last five years starts skyrocketing up 
the sports pyramid. Okay? So this is Americans 12 and older. This next slide, again, from the NFL sponsorship deck. This one is what sports are Americans watching on TV? But not all Americans. Americans 18 to 49, the sweet spot for advertisers and for building brand loyalty. See, my father, 73, he grew up on baseball. I'm 49, I grew up on football. I have three teenage kids. They've grown up on soccer. So you take out my dad's generation. Look at MLB, goes all the way down to fifth. And look at soccer, now it's third. NFL, college football, soccer. Above the NBA, above college basketball, MLB, NASCAR, golf, NHL, tennis. Again, 10 years ago, soccer's not on that slide. Huge growth in the last five years. So clearly, as I'm out at these soccer events and I'm starting to see what's happening with my own eyes, I see the research to see that that phenomenon is happening all over the United States. So then we started to ask, I started to ask myself, what would it take to make it work in Cincinnati? Because it's, it's not worked before when other people have tried it. Well, the first uh, model of, uh, for success needs strong ownership. That's the same for any startup. Any startup needs strong ownership, you need to be patient. You need to give, get the resources in order to build your company the right way and do things at a high level. Number two, you need experienced sports management. In the past, these efforts have been led by what I call soccer enthusiasts. They mean well, but they don't have the background in order to launch and run a professional sports franchise. Number three, you need a professional caliber for games. I say respectfully, you can't really call yourself a pro soccer team if you're playing in a high school stadium. You know, we're a pro team. We need money, so we need suites, club seats, sponsorship areas. We need the seats in different price points to be able to create the environment. Number four, you need a top-level professional league. Any of us who have been to kids' soccer and all the kids are sort of following the ball all around the field. We love our kids. We laugh about that, but we wouldn't exactly call that good soccer. And so we felt if we're going to introduce professional soccer to this community, it better be at a high level. And so when people look at it, they say, that looks professional. Everything I sort of thought is as we did this, the soccer, how we operated as a franchise, had to pass sort of that, that look test, that feel test. You know, the Supreme Court definition of pornography couldn't define it, but we know it when we see it. I, I think the same thing applies to professional sports. Can't really define it, but you know it when you see it. And so we were going to operate and be in a league that looked professional, that people would nod and say, OK, yeah, I see that. Uh, and then the last one, need to build a relevant sports brand in the marketplace. Very, very important. So what's, what's a relevant sports brand? Winning. People like winning teams. People like to support winning teams. Family friendly. So our prices, uh, the game day experience, the environment. I was the guy at the Bengals every Monday. I took calls from fans, people that bought the tickets and then had someone vomit on them or spill beer on them or throw, you know, cursing language awful all game long. And they're like, we spent $200 on tickets and parking and that's what I had to deal with? I didn't want that. I had 19 years of that. <laughs> so in building the brand, winning, family friendly, and last one's visible. You had to be out there. We had to be engaged. Uh, we had to let people know that we existed. Uh, and so we had to come up with a winning strategy to make sure we're visible. So our thought was if we did all those things, put all that together, executed with excellence, we'd have a chance to be successful. So here's our ownership group. Uh, Carl Linder III and his family from American Financial are majority owners. Obviously, their family had previously been majority owners of the Reds. Uh, Scott Farmer from Centos, George Joseph, Jack Wyant. Steve Hightower, the largest minority business owner in greater Cincinnati, Hightower Petroleum. Uh, so we have a very strong ownership group. On the management side, I, I mentioned Carl, my background from the Bengals. We hired John Harks to be our head coach. John, probably the most celebrated U.S. men's soccer player in recent history, the first American man to play in the English Premier League where he starred, uh, captain World Cup teams here in the U.S., uh, but had want, never been a head coach. He'd been a broadcaster and assistant, wanted to be a head coach. We gave him the opportunity. Uh, I'm advised my very first hire uh, was Mark McCullers. He, for 10 years, had been the president GM of the Columbus Crew. He knows the world and business of soccer. I know the world and business of pro sports, but I wanted someone who could sort of help me navigate through the business of soccer. And then Sarah Huber, our exec VP and CFO, she had been at Vantive and uh, Ernst and & Young and had some sports clients, including working with uh, the Linders when they owned the Reds. Uh, and then Jeff Smith, our VP of Sales, 
uh, for 10 years, was the chief uh, architect of all the sales efforts up at UC, both basketball and football. So the stadium, people ask all the time, you don't see a lot of college football stadiums, a lot of universities partnering with uh, uh, pro teams. What was in it for UC? Why did they do it? And I give the credit to Santa Ono and Mike Bone, the AD. They had the vision to see this as a win-win. You know, they got 40,000 college students on that campus. You saw the, de the, the research. A lot of them love soccer. And we fall right between March Madness and really the start of the college football season. So this gives them something very fun to do uh, right on campus. Number two, the largest international class ever at UC. A lot of those students coming from countries where soccer's number one. What a great way to acclimate into our community and acclimate into that campus than around a shared passion for soccer. You know, sports unites us. A lot of things divide us. Sports brings, the, brings us together. Uh, of course, I mentioned those 56,000 youth families. Guess what? A lot of them are coming uh, onto UC's campus for the very first time to come to our games, and they're just blown away by how beautiful UC is and the tens of millions of dollars invested. And of course, all our games are on TV. For us, we have revenue sources, again, advertising, premium seating, and the like that you need to run a professional sports team. So our games are played uh, on a soccer-specific field. We went out and spent over a million dollars to upgrade the uh, venue, including a, a new field. Again, if we're playing on football lines, you don't really look like you're an authentic uh, soccer team. So we went out, new turf, removable end zones for UC. You see the Cincinnati Bearcats, but for us, it's all green. Uh, it's very accessible and will be more accessible as the improvements come on with 71 and Martin Luther King and 75 uh, and then maybe the streetcar uptown someday. So it's a two hour, um, it's a two hour event. We tried to have most of our games at seven. So by nine o'clock, you can be down in OTR having dinner or a drink. You could be uptown. Young families can get those kids home and to bed. Uh, and so we think that that really fits our lifestyles. I mentioned that we made over a million dollars in uh, improvements, including the ability to have our own locker room. This is the visiting football locker room. So when UC's visiting football opponents come to UC, they're in our locker room. And they know they're in our locker room. Uh, I mentioned the premium seating, club seats, suites, premium uh, club, and, and the club lounge. Again, all important aspects of professional sports. That revenue is what allows us to go build a winning team. Uh, and to go do some of the marketing and community initiatives that we've done. Here's our league, 29 teams, the USL, it's going to be even bigger next year. Uh, I would divide it up into three categories. The first category would be similar to Major League Baseball. We have a Major League Baseball team and you have a Triple A team. Most people are familiar with that. 11 teams in our league would be akin to a Triple A affiliate to an MLS team. In soccer, they're called the twos, so LA Galaxy 2, New York Red Bulls 2. They literally, they are about player development, and literally every week, players who don't dress for the top team slide down and play against us. That's their advantage uh, against us. And the two teams in the league final this year, which is this uh, Sunday, are both twos, one from Sporting Kansas City and one from New York. Uh, and then you have uh, uh, the other third would be minor league markets, Rochester, Charleston, Richmond, right? They probably have minor league baseball teams, and we would consider them somewhat minor league markets. Uh, and then the last are big league markets. So you have Charlotte, Pittsburgh, St. Louis, San Antonio, Oklahoma City, uh, and of course Cincinnati, where we have other big league uh, teams and other sports, and we're trying to sort of jockey to be in the next round of MLS expansion. So uh, again, I said a winning team. So uh, we, we spent quite a bit of money. There's no salary cap. We went out, John Harks and I, and said, let's put together the best team we can to win right out of the gate. Uh, so uh, we finished third, 26 players. 11 of our guys had played in the MLS, including Austin Berry, who was the rookie of the year when he was in MLS. Uh, and then we're allowed to have up to seven internationals. We have guys from Australia and Spain and England uh, and, and France and some other countries, uh, a part of our roster who loves Cincinnati. Uh, we had some open tryouts. Two guys actually showed up and made the team out of open tryouts. Uh, and uh, then we had an invitation only, mostly for the guys who were playing college last fall, and then once their college season ended, they rolled right in and uh, joined our team. So our season's pretty similar to baseball. Baseball teams go off to spring training in February. We went down to Florida uh, to IMG where we won a tournament down there in our first ever event, came back for some friendlies, started in April, really rolled through into September. The playoffs were in October. Uh, 30 matches this year, 15 home, 15 away. Next year, it's actually going to be 32, so 16 and 16. 
So this is uh, when we won the IMG Classic, again, our first ever event. Uh, we got $10,000, of which the coaches spent three times over before they made it home from Florida. <laughs> I talked about family-friendly pricing. So um, our 2017 season tickets uh, with, uh, in the general reserve areas, non-club, club seats went up a little bit. Uh, but we tried to keep uh, everything else flat. Um, but you can see, if, you know, the college students, $50, that's $3 a game. Uh, on an individual game basis, it was $5 a game. The Bailey, $120, again, that's over 16 games. So you had an opportunity about eight bucks, and as you sort of go up, you see eight, 10, 12. Uh, I think our most expensive tickets midfield were about $25. So again, we priced it where we thought we had the advantage. We have a, a 35,000 seat venue. So we wanted to keep prices low. So regardless of anyone's economic position, in terms of a college student, a high school student, fam working families, starting their career, what have you, anyone wanted to come, they could come. There would be no price point that would prevent someone from coming to our games. Uh, I talked about building a visible brand. So uh, branding in the community, visiting children's hospital, partnerships with the zoo, clinics with Cincinnati Recreation Commission, going to public schools, partnering with the youth clubs, all a part of being uh, a visible brand. Let me tell you, when I was at the Bengals, the Bengals do incredible things in the community. Uh, the Marvin Lewis Community Fund and some of the things that our guys do going up to Children's Hospital, it's unbelievable. Most people don't know about it. And they don't know about it because the Bengals feel their philosophy is we don't do it for a pat on the back, we do it because it's the right thing to do. I always felt, and so when I talked to Carl about what, what are the things that I would do different than the Bengals, this was my first point. And because I believe that you're not looking for the pat on the back as a sports franchise. That's not why you publicize your good works. You publicize your good works because your fans, your supporters, want to know that you're in it together. They want to know, hey, if we're giving you our money and our time and our passion, uh, we want to know that you're, you're with us in making this community a better place. And so my point was we're going to be a, a visible brand in terms of all the things that we do in the community because in my mind, that's part of the deal. And so this is us signing autographs, our players signing autographs after all the games. Again, when we signed players, character was a big part of it and their commitment. Hey, you're coming on board to a team that's launching year one. This kind of thing is expected. If you're not on board for this, just let us know and you can go to established club and we'll wish you good luck. But if you're gonna be with us, these are the kinds of activities you're gonna do on a regular basis. So another visible brand is merchandise. Obviously, what a, you know, maybe not a better visible way than people walking around wearing your marks, wearing your jerseys, wearing your shirts, your hats, your scarves. So let me share a little bit. The person that helped me build this franchise, Gary DeJesus, had been at Procter & Gamble for over 10 years as a brand manager. And so he was pretty well versed in consumer behavior theory. And so our colors, blue and orange, how did that happen? Well, Gary knew that orange is considered a very warm color. People have good energy towards warm. Red and yellow are considered hot colors. Some people love those colors. Some people can't stand those colors. But the molding of the two, orange, is considered in consumer behavior a very good color. So orange. Everyone loves blue, orange and blue. I didn't particularly like orange and black. It makes me think of Halloween all year, and I don't want to think of Halloween all year. So orange and blue. Then the color was, well, which blue? So we did consumer research, and we looked at teams with orange and blue, so the Florida Gators, Clemson, uh, Syracuse, the Denver Broncos, and all different sports. And we found that teams with orange and blue combination are among the top sellers of merchandise. So that gave us some thought that, okay, these, this combination's good. So our marks, the lion is the lion of St. Mark the Evangelist. We want all of our fans to be evangelists for Cincinnati and soccer. So uh, we named our team FC Cincinnati. We're not the Cincinnati Hammerheads or the Strikers. We're FC Cincinnati because this is all about announcing to the world that we're a city on the rise uh, and uh, we have what it takes. So we're FC Cincinnati, be an evangelist for Cincinnati and soccer. The wings obviously representing speed and movement, which is the fluidity of the game of soccer. Obviously the sword, a level of fierceness. The crown, we're the queen city and a soccer ball in the hand. So we came up with our marks and our colors, and then uh, we went out and hired people to help us execute a, a, a strategy for merchandise. Our head of merchandise spent 14 years as a director at Ralph Lauren, married to someone from Cincinnati, came here, needed a job, perfect. 
<laughs> so I would tell you, we set a, a budget of uh, about $500,000 in selling merchandise. And the league said, you'll never do that. And I said, watch. Uh, and I can tell you, we're two and a half times that. We, if we have a good Christmas, we'll be around 1.5 million in merchandise sales. So again, trying to keep our prices low and, and realize the economic return through the quantity of what we're selling and in the process, building a visible brand. Uh, we felt it was important to partner with some of the leading brands in this city. And so when we went out to do uh, partnerships, our, our message to, uh, to some of these leading companies was not, we need this amount of money. Our message was, we need you to be a part of this because we think this is a winner for Cincinnati long term. How do we get you in? And so we worked with them to then develop some sponsorships, be it the Kroger uh, family of the match. Procter & Gamble did youth clinics with us. And so all the clinics we did with Cincinnati Recreation Commission were sponsored by Procter & Gamble. So we found different ways to involve some of the top brands. And as you can see, we had over 6,000 season tickets. We're renewing at a high rate. We'll hit 10,000 this year. Uh, we've already sold a bunch of deposits uh, for next year. Three times we set the USL attendance record in the regular season, uh, and we blew it out of the water in the postseason. Just to give you a sense, in our league, the average attendance is 3,500. We averaged over 17,000, and we had three games over 20,000, and one game, our uh, playoff game, over 30,000. We put our games on TV, again, a, vi a visible brand. So this one was pretty hard. Is it, when we put our business together, this one was hard. So we put an RFP. I knew all the GMs from the TV stations in town. I thought I could get a pretty good deal. And I was surprised that I didn't get a very good deal. <laughs> so I had to go to Carl Linder and said, here's the deal. We're going to finance being on TV. And so we're going to hire David Asbrock, who produces the Bengals preseason games. Uh, we're going to have a satellite truck. We're going to have to rent high-definition cameras. We're going to hire the talent. We're going to do the whole thing, uh, and it's going to cost us a lot of money. And then we're going to bet on ourselves to go out and sell the sponsorships, the advertising during the game. However, if you're a brand, what's your ratings? I don't know. We haven't been on TV before. You know, what's your attendance? How many people are going to be in the stadium? I don't know. You know we think over 10,000. So at the end of the day, we took that bet. But here was what I said to Carl. When you think of pro teams in this market, what do they all have in common? The Reds, the Bengals, Xavier basketball, UC basketball and football. What do they all have in common? Our top teams. They're all on TV. The Cyclones. I go to some Cyclones games. Our players are now going to Cyclones games. And, you know, but respectfully, they're not on TV. And so I said to Carl, do we want to be considered up here with these guys or down here? I don't think we want to. Everything we're doing is to be... We're a major league soccer team, whether or not we're in the USL or MLS. We're operating as if we're an, an MLS team. Got to be on TV. So we made the bet. We lost some money, uh, but I do feel that it was a big part of our attendance. Because as anyone's read the book, The Tipping Point, I sort of wrote our marketing strategy around that. And I felt that being on TV was a key part of tipping. And so when the first people would start coming to the game, uh, you know, the, the soccer enthusiasts, some of the youth families, they would come, there would be this great environment. We knew that the Bailey would be what the Bailey was. Um, word of mouth would get out. You know, the cocktail parties, the water cooler, people would start talking, have you been to the game? It's a lot of fun. The next step would not necessarily be for people to buy a ticket and come to the game. For many, the next step would be to check it out on TV. What is this that they're talking about? I wanted to make it right easy. And so all of our games with Sinclair, over-the-air television. You don't need cable or satellite, over-the-air, or, of course, cable satellite uh, to be able to check the games out. And then through the year, our ratings became the second highest uh, watch show uh, in almost every game uh, during, uh, during uh, when we're on air. So we were never number one, uh, but frequently we were number two, outperforming NBC uh, and Fox, including other uh, sports like the NBA playoffs, NHL playoffs. Uh, obviously, uh, a lot of people consume their uh, news on social media, so I hired someone uh, who I thought was pretty good. He's sort of at the top end of that millennial group. Um, he had been working for a higher ed company and blogging, soccer blogging, on the side. 
And so I'd been watching him write about us and um, said, how would you like to do this full time? He said, I think you just saved my marriage. I was coming home, <laughs> having dinner, and then going to my office to do my blog. Uh, and so DJ's done a pretty good time. So we came up with some pretty creative things. Uh, that orange out, that was on the front page of ESPN.com an entire day. Uh, and then you could see some of the soccer analysts uh, commenting pretty favorably. Uh, the first, this was when we had 23,000 for the Pittsburgh game. That was the orange out. This is uh, the MLS Reddit page. So this is the MLS, their page, not ours, where they list the attendance of the top soccer franchises in the U.S. All of them are, you know, MLS except for one. And you see FC Cincinnati is above five MLS teams. So again, capturing attention. Supporter groups, big part of the soccer culture was to, or the supporter groups. They're the ones that create the environment. We knew that if we did this right, people who, I'm a red season ticket holder, obviously the Bengals, I've been to a lot of games, but there is something unique about a supporter culture at a professional soccer game. And so we went out and these supported our fans who created authentic supporter groups. We don't control them. We empowered them. We trusted them to say, go out and create the environment in, in the mold of what you want our club to be. Uh, and they just did a tremendous job. So uh, on social media, you can see we have 28,000 followers on Twitter. Uh, pretty explosive growth. Facebook, over 40,000. Instagram, we're up to 21. We've been a little slow with Instagram. But if we compare ourselves to Sacramento Republic, St. Louis, and San Antonio, those are some of those franchises that we're competing against for MLS. You see that we're far above St. Louis and San Antonio, and we're trailing Sacramento, who's in their fourth year. So probably the highlight of the year was the Crystal Palace match, Crystal Palace of the English Premier League. You know, we said that soccer is the world sport, and with Crystal Palace, we were bringing the world to Cincinnati. So, English Premier League, we had an opportunity. We had an open Saturday. We did that strategically. I would share with you, Mark McCullers said, Saturday in July, uh, these international teams will be looking to come to the United States. They'll play a Wednesday and a Wednesday against MLS teams. No MLS team will have an open Saturday in July because of COPA and the European Championships. They'll be playing straight through once those tournaments are over. So we got the league to give us an open Sunday, which gave us our choice of EPL teams. Uh, and we had four or five of them wanting to come to Cincinnati. So with that, we settled on Crystal Palace. Uh, Crystal Palace, when we made the deal, obviously an established club, but then as we got closer to our game, they made it to the FA Cup final. The FA Cup is the English Cup final. So it's not just the English Premier League, it's the, all the leagues together playing a tournament. They played in the final against Man United. They uh, lost uh, in the uh, added time uh, minutes just a tremendous match. And so all of a sudden now there's a little more notoriety about Crystal Palace. They're led by Alan Pardew. Alan Pardew, established player, a star from the EPL, has been a very successful manager for a number of years. Uh, and we pulled out all the stops uh, to show them a first class uh, experience in, in highlighting what's great about our city. Can we get some sound? That won't be as good without sound. <laughs> Can you, from back there? Can you go back? Here we go. Alan, a 2-0 victory and two great goals as well. Yeah, but tonight wasn't about the football, really. It was about this club and the way that uh, the whole place was un unbelievable tonight. Never experienced anything like it in my life uh, for pre-season, <laughs> like a cup final, and it was uh, brilliant. Uh, yeah, this club is fantastic.
Nicholson wanting to let it rip. He will with his oh. left foot. And wouldn't that have been a special moment? Much with a right foot, and there it is. Crystal Palace is on the board. It's a sold out crowd, 35,000 and change here at Nippert Stadium. But it has to be a great thrill just to look out and see oh, it's, the stadium it's tremendous. in tremendous. Obviously, we're so grateful for the embrace of our community. Uh, we said from the very beginning, Cincinnati is a big league sports town, and I think we're showing it tonight. Because we're a very proud city. We get behind our club, FC Cincinnati, and uh, they certainly stood up and you know, they applauded everybody, both, both teams. I thought it was excellent, excellent. That war, you know, that, that, that atmosphere, you know, from the, from the fans, it was amazing. You know, just to see that in Cincinnati, absolutely great. Taking a shot at Dan Williams with a big save on the legend. Unbelievable. Seeing going up against these guys, it just, it's just it's so unbelievable. Dream come true. The love for soccer is in Nippert here tonight. A sellout against an international friendly. Has this exceeded your expectations? FC Cincinnati has taken the city by storm. It is electric here at Nippert. Look at the Bailey. Look at the crowds. I mean, this is a soccer town. I think it's a sport of the future for America. And we've got the Reds and the Bengals, and I think we're going to have FC Cincinnati for a really long time. So that's the story of FC Cincinnati, Chapter 1. And I, you have my commitment that Chapter 2 is going to be even greater. Uh, we're just getting started. So thank you all very much. I'm sure some of you have some questions for Jeff. I know I've been in that amazing stadium and that amazing atmosphere. And I don't know what you've done or what you feed those Bailey folks, but uh, it's, it's an incredible part of the stadium. I wasn't sitting in last time. I might have to change that. But questions for Jeff? You alluded to, to chapter two a little bit earlier. Just curious, what area do you see when it comes to the next year? Sure, the, everyone couldn't hear it. What will be the targeted improvement areas in uh, year two? Well, number one is to win the championship. Uh, <laughs> if you're not in this business to win it all, get out of the business. Uh, and so uh, I, my whole team, and I have Tommy Rogers and Nicole Rooney here, they're literally, we lost and, uh, on uh, Sunday. We were all in the office Monday morning, bright and early, and no one's taken any time off. We jumped right into what we need to do better, and it starts with the team doing better, which means I have to be a better general manager. Our coaches have to be better coaches. Uh, we met one-on-one -on -one with all the players. Most will be back, but there'll be a few that won't be back. But we need to have a better team, and we want to be lifting that trophy. And that's not an unreasonable goal. Uh, we obviously have revenues to go out and add pieces to make us a better, more exciting team. So that's a big part. Uh, we're ex uh, expanding Nippert Stadium. So we're going to take uh, the first row out of Nippert, the first row of seats, plus the walkway that goes around. Right now we have a 70-yard uh, wide field. We'll have a 75-yard wide field. We struggled at times against teams that don't have the talent, and so they'd sort of bunker in and make it very hard for us to move the ball through. Well, now they're going to have more field to... Uh, defend and it should open up the game a little bit more with that international standard uh, width. Uh, so that'll be number two. Number three, we obviously want to get up to 10,000 season tickets uh, and uh, we want to improve our sponsorship performance. We did okay there. We need to do a lot better, but now we have a, a proven brand that we can go out and sell. We're looking to put all of our games on TV. The league requires us to put our games on YouTube, which is how most visiting teams, their fans back home, watch the game. And so when we would go to New York or where have you, fans would have to watch the game digitally. And a lot of you know, my kids do watch games, TV shows digitally, but a lot of us still like to look at the box and see the game. And so we're going to work to put all of our away games on, uh, on TV. Um, the other two sort of macro level improvements, um, we're going to develop a youth academy. My experience in the youth soccer community here, there's tremendous players locally. Um, and we're going to give the boys a pathway, and we're also going to be very involved in a high level uh, on the girls' side 
to, uh, to support uh, the youth soccer program here. Uh, and then equally, all of our uh, practices this year for the most part were at Nippert Stadium on the turf. And I've been quietly working out in the community to develop a, a training facility on grass where we have a couple very high level grass fields and locker rooms and whatnot off site. And uh, that deal's coming together. Uh, the last thing I would say is we probably are going to look to have more than one international friendly next year, maybe one more at the beginning of the year, one towards the end. I'm headed to England next week, uh, meeting with Crystal Palace, meeting with Spurs uh, and some of the other clubs over there. And then I'm headed up to the Netherlands uh, to spend some time uh, there, talking to clubs, checking out their training facilities, talking about how they built their youth program. Obviously, the youth development in Europe is far surpassing what we have here in the US. So we'll learn some things, bring some things back, and probably with that, maybe some opportunities on the player side as well as on the friendly side. Mr. Jeff? Um, hi, I'm actually a Bailey season ticket holder and a member of Dean and Stott. So hey, thank you. Of course, um, already renewed for next season, so we're good. Uh, what is uh, your, with the MLS possibility, what is that, I mean, I know it's crazy and it's out there, but what would you think is the time frame for that and, and what type of things are, are you moving forward to try and make that happen? Thank you for the question. Um, so when we launched, most fans in our you know, city had never heard of USL, and so we felt it was important to state right off the bat, you saw it on my uh, first slide really, that we're a major league sports town and we were committed to bringing soccer at the highest level to Cincinnati. The highest level available to us initially is the USL. It's an aspirational league. They have a number of teams, be it Portland, Toronto, Montreal, of course Orlando I mentioned, who have gone from our league and then moved up as a part of MLS expansion. And so we wanted to state unequivocally that that is our uh, goal. And then we just went about being the best franchise we could be uh, and be the best contributor to the USL we could. I say that because we felt it was important to understand and, you know, you get invited to the party. You don't invite yourself to the party. And so we wanted to be humble and respectful to the MLS, their timeline, their process, uh, and just do everything we could do to make Cincinnati successful to the point that they had to invite us. Uh, so their process is in November, they're going to have a board of governors meeting, their owners, and they're going to announce a, a formal process. Uh, and I'm aware of some elements of that, but some of it is still being worked out. Uh, after they announce that, Commissioner Don Garber of the MLS is going to come to Cincinnati for a site visit. He doesn't come to every city, but he's coming to Cincinnati, and he's going to have a whole day that will, be, uh, that will include a tour of some of the key economic uh, developments in our city in the urban core. So from the riverfront around Fountain Square in the Central Business District, up to over the Rhine, and then to uptown. Uh, and uh, then we'll have a public town hall meeting at 4 o'clock. It'll be in the urban core. We're still finalizing the site, but it'll be an open town hall. We'll be able to have more than 500 people there to ask him questions and have him talk about his vision for the MLS and where he sees it going and um, his thoughts uh, about Cincinnati. Uh, I think it's our expectation that right now they're moving from 20 to 24. They've said they're going to move from 24 to 28. We're trying to establish ourselves as one of the top four teams. We'd really like to be the obvious number one. Sacramento, who's done this a little bit longer than us, may have something to say about that. Uh, but we're going to go through the process. And I would tell you, based on everything we've achieved, and again, you haven't seen nothing yet, uh, we're pretty bullish on Cincinnati. Well, thank you so much. If you all can join me in thanking thank Jeff. Thank you.